I'll start with um, just very short introduction to large deviations on metric spaces. Uh, because usually um, I skip this and talk about Euclidean space uh, so that it's easier, right? But here I think I can start with the metric space and we can be okay with that. And then I'll explain what the mean setting is and um, I will give a couple of examples of classical theorems and then I'll explain why we cannot do what was done there and why it's interesting, hopefully. Okay, so, um, so we start with nice um, topological space, Hausdorff usually, yes, that's, we should mention it here, right? Uh, but actually with all, yeah, in all applications we'll have a nice metric space, uh, moreover metric measure space. Uh, and I will give us an example of Heisenberg group or some Karna groups, but it will be very concrete, hopefully. So we'll denote the space by M, and we would be interested in finding a function that we'll call rate function, so it's from M to U. Uh, in principle, sometimes we can include the infinity as its value, so let's keep it this way. And um, we don't want it to be identically infinite, but uh, this is a function that we want to find. So it's rate function. And what we want to do is we want to look at the limit of the following. So I'll skip lots of details here. So we'll have a sequence um, of probability measures on um, M with parallel sigma algebra. So again, if I assume that it's nice metric space, then this is natural setting we should take. And what we want to do is um, we want to find this read function so that this limit exists have a sequence of probability measures on this measure space. The question is, the first question is whether this limit exists, right, the existence. And then if it does, we want to identify, if possible, this rate function. I'm skipping lots of details about different um, types of these functions because for metric spaces, actually things are much better because you have uh, sequential uh, convergence, so you can replace um, certain characteristics of how to find this limit or how to identify this function by something that I will talk about uh, in a second, okay? So, um, what we want to do eventually is to take this metric space to be finer dimensional group like Heisenberg group with a metric that is called Karnak Ritzeberg metric it has a nice measure, reference measure, which is hard measure. And you can ask the same question where these measures will come from a random walk, okay? So essentially what we'll see is that, yes, you have this convergence, but it's much more difficult to identify this rate function. So why would we uh, be interested in this? For this, I'll uh, give you a couple of examples from classical setting for large deviation principles, and we'll actually look not only at the um, sequences, but also more continuous version of large deviation principle on the path space, on winner space, and I'll explain the significance of this rate function there, okay? So, uh, 
So before that, so I'm going in the different direction from what I usually do uh, in this talk, because uh, um, again, as I said, certain topological questions here are probably easier to address them for my usual audience. And so I decided to start with that. Did I say it's joint work with my co-authors? I forgot that. Did I? Okay, so this is why I put it on there. Okay, so uh, the original work was with Time Melcher and Jing Wang. And um, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize, and I asked a certain question um, more than a year ago, and Dan was actually the one who um, said that we might be able to do it. So it's not finished yet, it's work in progress. But I'll explain what the question is and why this group of people is the right group of people to ask these questions. Okay. So, uh, for uh, metric spaces, uh, we can replace uh, the fraction of finding this kind of limit by proving two bounds. One is an upper bound and a lower bound, and depending on the circumstances, one is more difficult than the other. So what we can do instead of doing that is prove this kind of bound for all open sets in the metric space, and here this bound for all closed sets in your metric space. So this is open and closed. So I did not put quantifies, but it's for all open, all closed sets. Okay. I'm going to understand the argument here is a set and here it's a point. So it's just consistent. It's, it's kind of the same thing, yeah. Um, because, yeah, here I think of this as a function on Borel sets. Mm -hmm. And here on um, points, but you can replace one by. But the mu yeah. also is here, the mu n is, is the Borel set, and on the left it's. It's the same f. So somehow here, this here it's a closed set. Yeah. yeah but it's a, here it's a variable f. You take the infimum over all f, and on the left. Okay, side. I can think about rate function as a map from metric space to zero one uh, zero infinity, or I can think of that as uh, yeah. depending on Borel sets on M. Well, formally, this is not quite right when you wrote. So it's uh, you have O on, on both sides or F on both sides. Give it another name, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, now you okay. Okay. Okay now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um so let's do a couple of examples. Um so the first example will be that's why I'm sitting in the first row, so if you need help, I'm <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> How's my handwriting? Is it it's fine? Okay. Okay. Um so I'll start with something that, uh, yeah, so this, these are classical theorems, and I, I will just explain why we cannot use them, for example, and things like that. So, um, so this theorem is um, half space of, say, Brownian motion. So we start with um, continuous function starting at zero. Okay, um, so this is. Near space. And yes, we as always equip it with the soup norm, so that's what we do. So then I take uh, just real valued bound in motion, and then I looked at the scaling of this with small epsilon. Okay. And this corresponds to a uh, sequence of measures, if we can think of that like this. Okay. okay. So, 
Okay, so then, um, since you do know a lot about driving motion, right, about increments and so on, um, you can actually prove that um, this converges to zero, this epsilon goes to zero in probability, and actually you can estimate the remainder term, it goes to zero exponentially fast. There are very detailed estimates, and they can be used to prove uh, the theorem that I'm about to formulate. So the theorem says that if you look at this family of measures on um, the winner space, then it satisfies the large deviation principle. I should have said that this is the large deviation principle here. So let me put it up, right? This is what I should do. Okay, so what it says is that this family of measures satisfies the large deviation principle with good rate function. I, will, I did not explain what it means, but we can kind of forget about it for now, uh, which is given here. So he is the map from here to the line, okay? But what we'll, we'll do is some about the family of measures. They come from here. These are distributions of scale running motion. Ah. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's infinite if um, it's finite and is equal to this, if this integral is finite, right? And it's infinite otherwise. So what's the significance of that? But you need some smaller class of functions then, the continuous ones, right? Exactly. The continuous you need. So remember, I did say that it might be infinite, right? So yeah. what we're saying here is that there is a subclass of your space, M. Um, in this case, it's infinite dimensional space, Wiener space on which this rate function is finite. And these are exactly the functions for which this norm is finite. These are Cameron-Martin paths. And as we know from Brownian motion, these are exactly, really exactly the ones that uh, if you shift Brownian motion by this path, you get distribution which is absolutely continuous with respect to the original one. It's if and only if statement, okay? So this is what's called uh, an energy functional also, and this is significant. So essentially what we see here is that the, uh, the rate function in this case has significance that is for our system, it describes uh, where the energy is finite. And we know that for most of Brownian paths, right, it will be infinite. So it's a huge, dis uh, huge uh, assumption right, on these paths. But these are exactly <laughs> the ones that um, uh, leave the measure absolutely continuous with respect to the translation by these paths. Okay, are we okay with this? So the question is, first, how do you prove this? And how do you uh, find this um, functional uh, rate function in this case? And there are lots of different proofs, and I did allude to one of them, which was about this uh, convergence to zero exponentially fast. That can be used as part of it, but a large part of at least one proof really relies on the fact that I just mentioned that if you take a Brownian path, move it 
Cameron Martin theorem or um, as Versch tried to tell me many years ago, I should only say Gersanov, but it's not really true, but <laughs> in his memory, let's do it, right? Um, so essentially it tells you exactly the translations uh, that leave the linear measure absolutely continuous with respect to the one we started with. So, um, so you can see that if you are going to the path space of, say, metric space like this, you would hope for something like this, right? Cameron Martin type result. Or very fine estimates on the convergence. Um, so as we'll see, this is not really possible in most of settings that I'm interested in, and therefore we have to use something else. Um, so what else can you do? Yeah. In the large deviations of principle that you will get, uh, how often is it infinity? Um, um, how, which set would you contain? Yeah, that's a good one? question in terms of often, right? How do we measure often? So the Cameron Martin space, that is the space of these functions that have this uh, energy finite, has measure zero with respect to the winner measure. So this is really an infinite dimensional phen phenomenon. So it doesn't happen in, like, it, it's really, you cannot reproduce it in finite dimensions. But in terms of stats, then, uh, for which the equivalent uh, pair would be? Uh, this is still a nice metric space, right? So we can still go for this characterization that I've written, if that's the question. Uh, no, I mean, for which sets uh, you would hope that the limit is not infinity, because you would have some. Ah, okay, so I will not answer this very directly, but I will just say that if you take, so the space of functions for which this is finite is called Cameron Martin subspace mm -hmm. of that large space of uh, continuous functions with the soup norm. Uh, this is a Hilbert space. And um, what's known is that the level sets for Cameron Martin um, space, uh, Cameron Martin norm are compact with respect to that, so that's what's used. So uh, the game usually is to uh, not just reduce it to these two bounds, but also say that it's enough to consider it for you know, even smaller sets of sets and things like that. So it's, it becomes quite technical, and I don't, I'm, I'm definitely not an expert, and, but I, I know how to do it in some cases, okay? But uh, more or less, Proving it for any set sometimes is difficult, but depending on your setting, you can uh, reduce it to uh, something else. Okay. For example, um, sequences and things like that. But in this setting, uh, things are more complicated because it's infinite dimensional. <coughs> so essentially, I, I would not like to think about Cameron Martin as a subset of this, but rather a different set is acting on that, so but that's a different matter. Okay, so, so the things that, um, so there are several uh, major things that I, I think this example exemplifies is that the first, of course, we can identify the rate function. It has significance uh, for the winner measure, right? It's the Cameron Martin norm or energy of the path. Um, there are also, um, as I said, um, other things that I didn't mention about uh, properties of Cameron Martin norm, but there are also other things that we should keep in mind, which will be kind of similar to what we have, which is that we know that um, Brownian motion has space-time scaling property, right? So if you scale it here, you can put it in, in time here. So if you move to something like just a metric space, right, that might not be there. But the kind of objects I'm taking, actually, you do have it. So that's useful. Um, also, it's Gaussian. So you know lots of things about increments and how to estimate them. And that we will not have, OK? OK, so how about uh, random walks? So I'll talk about random walks now. Oh, 
Probably there was an assistant who was doing this, right? <laughs> <laughs> you want this, an assistant? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> it's, it's just me. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I say things and then I think, right? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I didn't do it well, I know this now. So I will not go to anything complicated, it's just uh, um, real line. So uh, we have a sequence of IDs here. And, um, and there is, uh, so for each story, there is apparently some moral, as we'll see. So we define this, this look moment of is that this as we know it's not just two uh, by x here I denote random variable with the same distribution as we have there so so we have this convergence which is not what we want but uh, I mean, we want it, but we're not interested in this. <laughs> we definitely want this, right? Um, and then you have the um, Oh, this is Legendre transform. Okay. okay, so um, so I'm talking about different versions of Cromer's theorem. Again, um, I did give this talk with slides before, and therefore I could put lots of different versions of things and explain. So I will just not write as much now, but I will talk about why what's the different aspects of this so this is a very classical theorem and of course the point is here that we have this limit no matter which um, distribution for this ids you take right and um, but the point is that if, so this doesn't give you much in terms of much information about the rate functions so remember we have two questions whether the large deviation principle holds, which this thing says yes. And the other one is, can you find the rate function, which is given very explicitly here by the Legendre transform of lambda, right? Except that, as we know, you cannot find it explicitly in most of cases, but just for some of this. Um, 
functions. So while this convergence uh, is what people call a uh, reflection of universality of these objects, right? Um, actually, finding a rate function depends on which, uh, which samples you take. And so the one thing that I want to mention here, and I'll probably write a little bit more about this, is that um, to connect it to um, Schiller's uh, theorem, uh, what you can do, you can actually fit in normal normals here. And then you can identify this thing because uh, um, x squared is one of the functions for which you can find explicitly Legendre transform, which is x squared, modulus some constants, right? And that exactly gives you the energy functional that we had before, okay? So I'll record it now. Is it, are we still okay? Yeah. So, so the point is that this is something, this is a starting point, right? So whatever the uh, random walks I will have, I need to prove some kind of, um, I don't know, central limit theorem or whatever, right? And after that, we can try to find the limit, except once we can prove that the limit exists. Uh, but in this case, uh, we know that we can find it only if we fit in um, normal, normally distributed IIDs, okay? And actually, if I even stop the slides, then I want to present that argument because it's relatively easy. So maybe I'll just record it very quickly. You know what? I'll do this like this. We'll recycle, right? <clears throat> so if I take here, okay? Is it okay? So everything is okay, except that here you'll have your, if you do the computation, again, we can reduce everything to, you know, intervals in this case, and compute it really, and you'll get minus x squared, and then you um, go for this and see that you get the, So how do we connect these two theorems? Cromer's a uh, couple of theorems and uh, the previous one, well, yeah, you can guess that we can try to take some kind of limit, right? Approximate Brownian motion by random walks and hope that things survive. And it actually works. So this gives you a different uh, argument to prove that large deviation principle for Brownian motion, okay? So what do we have here? Um, I kind of listed lots of things that we cannot use. So first of all, while um, I'll say that the uh, time space scaling will be there, it's still more complicated. You cannot call for something simple here because everything here is written in a way that you don't, like, if I replace this by another object that I will explain, that's okay, that we can make sense of. We even have central limit theorems for random walks on upper triangular matrices, for example, or um, for me, these are some proofs that it's an equivalent description. We have that. It's been known for many years, decades now. Um, and what we want to do is we want to prove that this limit exists and we want to identify this function and that's difficult because we don't have Cameron-Martin theorem there, so that's gone. Um, and uh, we don't always even have a good guess what this energy functional should be and we might not be able to go from this large deviation principle to the continuous version, okay? Uh, that actually is probably okay, but I will um, mention just one thing from a completely different direction, which explains why it might be difficult. So I'll do it a little bit later once we get to the 
uh, objects that I was promising to talk about, right? So how many, many of you have seen Heisenberg group before? No? Good, good, good. So should I explain what corner groups are, or is it better to stick to Heisenberg group? Well, explain the corner group. Is it okay? Okay. Okay, so, so let's start with that, and then I'll come back to this thing that I wanted to, the contraction principle that doesn't work. So, as you can see, I'm an extremely negative person. I'm telling you all the things that, you know, about all the things that don't work, right? Uh, I think it fits me quite well, unfortunately, but I will give you a positive message at the end. So, so hopefully we'll get there. <laughs> change. So what I want to do is I want to explain what kind of objects that I want my random walk to be on. So I will denote it by G. So this is a big group. And I will give you a very concrete realization of that so that we can uh, see what it means. So, so V group is a group that has uh, differentiable manifold structure on it. And uh, <coughs> in particular, it means that, and this is the wrong picture because current groups are unbounded, but I think it's better to keep this as a picture like a sphere, for example, like SU2 or whatever you, that's a three. And then at each point you have a tangent space that you can identify at the identity with what's called the Lie algebra. That is, it's a linear space that has additional uh, operation, which is a Lie bracket. So it takes two elements and spits out um, another Lie algebra element, okay? So it's anti-symmetric, it satisfies Jacobian um, identity and things like that. So in, for Karna groups, this Lie algebra has an additional structure. That is, you can write it as a uh, linear sum of several subspaces, such that if you take two of them, I think I decided, yeah. You can write it in lots of different ways, but more or less. So if you take all elements, um, say in V1 with itself, you get to the next one. It's time to give an example, right? Good. Okay, so what it does is the following. So it's a three-dimensional, so there are different structures, but we can think of that. So the Lie algebra in this case is real span of three elements. So there's a basis element, okay, um, such that the bracket of x and y is z, all other brackets are zero. So you have the stratified um, this is called stratified structure here, and in this case, it's just two spaces. One is the span of x and y, and another is z. Okay, this, so we bracket everything here, we get the third one. For why we call it h, oh, because it's Heisenberg, but also because it's horizontal from my other life, okay? And on z, we call vertical. Okay, so it's a three-dimensional object, and the lead group that corresponds to this 
um, is called the Heisenberg group. And you can realize it in lots of different ways. You can take um, three by three matrices, upper triangular matrices, or what I prefer is uh, to take the Heisenberg group as the Heisenberg group power symplectic um, space with, say, symplectic form. That, so more or less H is realized as R3 in this case. Uh, where you take um, elements like this and you use the usual addition, right, on R3 plus correction term which comes from the symplectic form, which would be x, y tilde. Well, that's really bad, right? The way I write, but I will put it up. Um, are we okay with this? So it's R3 with the usual addition. <laughs> Is it better? So it's the usual addition plus the correction charm that comes from the standard symplectic form. Okay. So it makes R3 into a non-commutative object, right? And I can prove it, but at this point you have to believe me that it's the algebra is really the, the one that I described before. Okay, so I'll skip some of the steps, but I'll explain what, uh, so what we want to do with this. Why these cardinal groups are interesting. So, I can appeal to some people with names like Gromov and blah, 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 but we'll not do that, right? Uh, but he, in particular, thought that they actually model more or less everything in geometry. Uh, but I, I will not go there, but essentially, they describe lots of situations where you have some kind of control system, right? So essentially, what we allow is we allow movement only in two directions, x and y. But because of this bracket condition, which is called Hermander's condition, um, you can actually reach any point in the group. So you only allow two-dimensional movement, but eventually you'll get everywhere. Okay? And you can prove it. It's not actually that easy. Uh, in, for Karna groups, in general, you have the same kind of picture, so you only allow uh, velocities from this smaller set, but you can get everywhere. And, and the norm you use uh, can be described in lots of different ways, but what we need to remember, it's not smooth. Okay, so certain things will not work as planned. So these are not Riemannian manifolds because you only uh, put in a product on the first layer, as we call it, and then you propagate it everywhere. So. The, the VI are infinite dimensional in the channel case? Um, the subspaces, VI? No, in, in the classical case, they're finite dimensional, but we do have some results, not with, okay, I have results with somebody else on infinite dimensional Heisenberg. Because you said the Lie group is not finite dimensional, or it's finite dimensional? No, it's finite, finite dimensional. No, everything right now is finite dimensional. What we can do to connect it to uh, Schultz's theorem would, would have been to take path space over these groups and then ask the same question, which would be more or less, almost equivalently asking whether you have Cameron Martin type result. And the answer is, I have no idea. That is, I know for Heisenberg, but I don't know in general. Okay? We okay with this? So there are lots of uh, things that I did not say here, but I will just describe the basic uh, Brownian motion on this group so that you will maybe see what the, some of the problems might be. Okay? So I'm skipping some geometry here and 
other things. So let's call it also an example. So it's Brownian motion on the Heisenberg group. So in this case, um, actually this case for all Carter groups, you can describe it explicitly as this triple, and this is good that we have it there. <laughs> okay. So V1, V2 are independent real valued Brownian motions. And this is the V stochastic area. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is the Brownian motion that corresponds to the structures that I just mentioned on the Heisenberg. You can equivalently, you can go for a, any kind of group and you'll have iterated V stochastic areas. For those of us who were here when Vlad Wysotsky gave his talk, he mentioned just this part here, a random walk. And so, of course, if you take a random walk here, as you can guess, you replace Brownian motions by random walks here, right? And you get some kind of dis discrete approximation for this one, if you're lucky. Okay, that would be your random walk here. So what we are interested in, in this object altogether, instead of just looking at the least stochastic area. So if you write it like this, again, for uh, those of us who've seen these objects before, you can see that the right time-space scaling would be the usual one for the Brownian motion. And here you would have a square root of that time, right? That's exactly the norm you take on the Heisenberg group when you talk about Cardinal groups. That's what people do in analysis that do. So it's consistent with this time-space scaling property we had for the usual Brownian motion, okay? So actually we have some elements of what we would um, expect to do, and um, I haven't reached the point where I even formulated my main theorem, right? I'll just um, mention one thing here, which is, so you can think of, this, so I think initially what we wanted to do was the following. We wanted to take a discrete approximation, random walk approximation to the driving noise here, V1, V2, and then use something like contraction principle, which allows you, if you have a continuous map, to prove convergence of this whole thing. And the problem here is that it's a well-known fundamental problem that these maps will not be continuous, no matter which um, norm on the path space you'll put here. So this is not an easy task, okay? So I'll formulate the theorem, I'll explain what the technical problem was and where uh, them came in, in that, okay? Okay? Good to have the cardinal groups. So the number of this k is called the step of this group. So for the Heisenberg, we say it's step two, meaning that, uh, so we usually assume that we don't take Euclidean space because that's commutative, right, abelian. But uh, step two actually is more than Heisenberg. Heisenberg is an example.
So I'm just thinking about which parts I should skip. So that we still survive. So in this definition is equal to two. Now I'll explain that we can actually prove more, but this is like a minimal. Um, Okay, so the first thing we want to define is what is horizontal random walk. So as you can see here, what we should do, we should fit um, in the noise in two variables, right, and see what happens to the third one. So that will be correction charm. So this is exactly what you do. And can you kind of imagine what happens for the Heisenberg in this case? So these uh, this correspond to I these random variables in the Lie algebra, so it's two-dimensional subspace of that. Every time I multiply this, I get additions here, which are just usual random walk, right? Plus a correction term, which will co come in the third component. And the next time you multiply by the next one, you add more and more. So actually, at the end, you get something that consists of the usual random walk, and you have to normalize it somehow, right? Plus this correction charm. And this correction charm is the one that is causing problems. OK? So what is that correction charm here in the uh, symplectic form? It's, um, so it takes samples and spits. Uh, so it takes, it's a polynomial of second degree, right? And so eventually, if you want to prove any kind of large deviation principle for this, you need to have concentration inequalities for uh, this kind of objects. OK? Is it clear that this is a problem, right? So what happens if we take a higher rank Karna uh, groups? Instead of quadratic polynomials here, we'll have higher order polynomials. And you need to have this con concentration inequalities for something independent of whatever you take, but using the structure of your group. And it turned out that it was not easy to do. And therefore, the initial result, and as I said, we have, we have more than that, but it's easier to formulate, is for current groups of step two. Because at least in that case, we uh, we only have to deal with um, quadratic polynomials, okay? And I'll explain what horizontal means. Um,
Okay, so I wanted to connect the um, things that we saw about the path space, right, for the uh, Ramian motion and uh, for the random walk. Remember, what I said was that, so this is the Legendre transformer game as before. The path is in the group, and I did say horizontal, I'll come back to this a little bit later. We have restrictions on how we can move. Um, so what it says is that you can find the uh, rate function like this, and I don't know about you, but I was not too happy with this because it's not very explicit. So that is, this is the part that says the limit exists, okay? So what we want to do now is we want to see if we can identify the limit, okay? And what did we do uh, in at least my picture? What, how did we identify that? We actually used random walk with normal samples. Remember, this gave us uh, here the, um, the general transform of x squared, which is x squared, and we got the energy function. So, so how, how d and sigma are related? Sigma is a path in the group. So let me replace it by Heisenberg. Is that okay? Then it becomes a little bit better. So it's a path space in the group we have. So what it says is that the random walk probably converges to Brownian motion we had, right, that I just have written, for which we can actually think about continuous path with some restriction here because we can only move in two directions. So what it means is not completely clear here, but I can explain later, which connects the identity in the group with any point in the group. So you identify the starting and end point, you take a path, right? You take, is it okay? Sigma prime of d is an element in the tension space. Yes. And what, when you apply sigma inverse, how, do I read this? What, what does it mean? It means that it will be in the Lie algebra. So this, so you have your path, right, of time t, you here, you only know how to measure things at the identity. So you pull it back, and this is how you compute the stuff. So your inner product eventually is only defined there. So you can kind of think that you either do this or you take your attention to space at the identity and move it by left to right multiplication all over the place and you have the inner product. It's a homogeneous structure, yeah. I will, okay, yeah. So since uh, J is, is a function on H rather than on the path space, this means that um, like, uh, the measures you're looking at are the time one distribution of? Uh, the distributions mm. of the random one. Oh, they're the distributions. Yeah. Are... yeah, I did not say that, yeah. Um, with some scaling, so I'll put one over n, but it actually has to be at the top of there. So you have to normalize it in a certain way, but that comes. I, I will, if I have one minute left, I will write what it means for the Heisenberg, uh, for the random walk in there. Are we okay with the statement? Because now I want to say that you can actually, if you use in this random walk, normal samples, you can identify the rate function. And I think that was uh, more of a, um, something that you can improve. And actually, that doesn't require step two. If you know this large division principle, then if, um, again, you take normally distributed uh, samples,
So what we proved was actually that um, if you take normal samples, you recover finite energy uh, paths here. So that's exactly what we saw before. Without, uh, and we don't have Cameron Martin, at least we didn't use it. We don't have this fact, at least for general partner groups, okay? And for the Heisenberg, we have something very complicated, which I'm not sure is the correct thing. Moreover, in this case, you can prove that it has more geometric meaning because there is a canonical choice of distance on this metric space, which is called Carnot squared. So there is distance, and what you get is that this is really the distance squared, which is not a simple thing. So there are lots of things packaged in this fact, uh, which is uh, that for Carnot groups, we know that this distance is realized on a one path, okay, so you know that it exists. And we know the same for the large deviation principle, so it's, um, it's consistent in this respect. But the fact that uh, there is this connection with geometry is something surprising, somewhat surprising, okay? So maybe I'll finish with half minute uh, example for the Heisenberg. I'll just write it here, how this product looks and where the problems um, actually appear. So I'll just erase this. Yeah, not good, right? But okay. Cool. So in this case, we start with a um, sequence of two sequences of I and D, so X and Ys. So I'll use Okay, so what you do, you add, so this is like random walk, right? This is a random walk. This is the correction term from the symplectic form. This is the quadratic polynomial I promised, right? And then what you want to do is you want to do some kind of, I'll write it like this, dilation, which means that you want to normalize it. So you normalize it here as usual, right? And when you do it here, you get, get what? One over n squared, okay? Is it clear? And that shows you exactly the time space scaling that is different, uh, that is, it's here, but you have to normalize the third component in a different way. And this is consistent with metric structure we're using. And it's exactly the same for higher rank Carnot groups where, yeah, I violated all the rules, right? Um, all the time. So, okay, I'm done. Thank you. Sorry.